Someone in my group said they couldn't play that week due to scheduling issues. Come next week, they leave the Discord server without any kind of warning or telling anyone. They never came back. A horror story that we all experience at some point in our D&D careers, unfortunately. And while we start this video off with something mild, it's just to ease you in, guys. Because buckle up, you're in for maybe the worst story we've ever read on the channel. There's nothing more for me to say here. Let's get started. Danger, danger, danger. Alright, I have been debating about posting this for literal years, but for the longest time I was too hurt to even think about what happened. Now though, I have two amazing groups I play with, and I have regained my love for D&D. I finally feel like I can post the story without it eating me up inside. I have fudged some insignificant details along with using a throwaway because to this day, I am still terrified of them ever finding me, even online. I apologize in advance for how long this is sure to be, but a lot happened, and I've never been one of few words. I also know this seems insane, but I'm not here to convince anyone. I'm just here to tell my story in hopes to both entertain with this horror I lived through and hope that maybe someone will read it and not end up in the same position I was. Now, on to what you care about, the horror story. Important players. Richard, the asshole of this story who played a half-elf edgelord blood hunter rogue. He is also a trans man, this is relevant later, I promise, who was 24 to 27 years old in the story. Myself, a chick playing a male gloom stalking while I was still UA. Drow Ranger that I fully admit was a dritz ripoff. I regret nothing. I was 19 to 21 in the story and I was also the only black person in the group. Unfortunately relevant later. Brian, the DM, super talented but a massive pushover. Also BF. Fs with Richard, 24 to 27, Tessa, the vengeance that became Oathbreaker Paladin, and both my and Richard's friend, 19 to 21 years old, Gina, my college roommate, who helped me through a lot of this shit. Also there, Monk, who is married to the DM, literally, they are an adorable couple, hope they're doing well still, Bard, not important to the story, but still one of the best bards I have ever played with. This horror story took place over three years, and should have ended after year two, but I had to learn no d and is better than bad D&D. This game finally taught me that, and stopped me from playing for over half a decade later. Since this is years and years old by now, obviously nothing is verbatim, but I shall try and remember everything as closely as possible, and some quotes I have, well, I just couldn't forget them. So, way back when, in college, a long while ago now, I've been playing D&D or D&D adjacent, Pathfinder, Labyrinth Lord, things like that since I was 14 years old. So by the time I was 19 slash 20 in college, I knew I loved these games. However, I had almost always been the dungeon master, so I was sorely lacking in player experience. So, in sophomore year, I finally managed to find a D&D group to play with on campus as a player. I was overjoyed. The DM was a writer, and damn, did he write us amazing stories. I literally literally cannot praise him enough for his world building and storytelling. His encounters were damn fun too. I had the most experience with D&D out of everyone in the group, so I helped where I could. I joined their second session, so I thought I was a little late, but no one seemed to mind much. I knew no one other than Tessa. I thought I befriended the others though through our time together. So in the beginning, I gravitated towards her and her paladin a lot. This is what caused the initial problems, but I didn't see them as problems at the time. See, Richard had a crush on Tessa. I didn't know this. His rogue and the paladin had this kind of will they, won't they thing going on that I assumed was only in game. It was not. So when I came in as a friend to Tessa and my drow came in swords blazing and charming the paladin, I became public enemy number one to Richard without knowing it at all. By accident, mind you, my drow eventually became the team dad who tried to keep everyone alive. So he wasn't even interested in these people. He saw them as his kids. I wanted to emphasize that Tessa and I were just friends as well and had only ever been friends. We never flirted or gave any indication we were more or wanted to be more than friends. Richard did not seem to care. It started instantly, as in our first literal session together, Rogue mentions that he doesn't like my ranger because he's a drow and all drow are backstabbing bastards and murderers, and got into a fight with my ranger over him trying to join the party, again because he was a drow. Everyone else was fine with me joining, since I had just saved them from some raging animals. We were level 2. 
Richard assured me that his rogue was just playing off some stuff that happened in his backstory and that it wouldn't be a problem going forward. He just had to have him object because blah 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 backstory. I trusted that this was true and that I wouldn't be subjected to racism every single time I played by a fellow player. I had to deal with that enough IRL. I know I'm not gonna remember to talk about this later because there's so much in the story. Guys, if you wanna cover mature topics like racism in your D&D games, that's great, but you have to talk about it before the game starts. That's a session zero thing, whether you're a DM or you're a player. Some people at your table may not be interested or may not want that kind of plot line in their game. It's impossible for you to confirm that if you don't ask first. Clearly not something that Richard here did. We continued this rather antagonistic relationship through the first storyline, which happened to be all about Rogue's backstory. My ranger ended up becoming the tank, while the paladin became the healer. My ranger slowly became part of the team and close friends with Bard and Paladin. Rogue was super edgy and into his backstory, so he mostly ignored everyone else, except at long rests. Everything seemed fine, though the constant yelling at me through roleplay that Rogue did was starting to get to me. He seemed to hate my character so much that after the end of the second storyline, about two years into the camp in total at the time, I was at my wit's end with the guy. He fully screamed at my character in almost every single session. And I mean, looking at me, this was in person, and screaming at the top of his lungs and saying things like he got super into roleplay and it wasn't personal, and it was always about something he perceived that I slash my character did wrong. Examples included, I made a joke he didn't like. I wasn't good enough at talking to a certain NPC. Despite me having negative charisma and not being the party face, I gave the paladin bad advice this one time. I was too close to the paladin. I stole his kills. I wasn't paying enough attention to him and his character while they were off on a solo mission. You get the point. Anything he perceived as a slight, he would wait until I did or said something he didn't like and we were having a rest, and then unleash his rage upon me. My drow wasn't one for confrontation, so he'd often scoff and brush the rogue off, telling him to get over himself. Now, I'm pretty good with yelling most of the time, but I come from an abusive household that would get screamed at by my parents all the time about everything they thought I did wrong or wasn't doing well enough. So this weekly was really starting to trigger me and I was starting to dread going to D&D despite how calm I played my drow. Richard had gone also back to his statement to leave the racism be and would often end things with, I'd expect nothing less from a stupid friggin drow spitting the race name with disgust. My roomie Gina convinced me to write out a message to Richard, politely asking him to just tone down the racism and stop actually screaming at me during the games. I asked him to perhaps just say something like, Rogue looks at Ranger and yells at him, and then say what he was yelling, instead of actually playing out some screaming. I explained why this bugged me, mentioning the abuse in my past, and also the racism was just something I really didn't want to deal with in a fantasy game that I played to escape real life. Gina was wonderful and helped me type this out. We must have rewritten it five times to make sure it was not accusatory to Richard in any way, to the point that, looking back on the messages, it puts most of the blame on me and my emotions. Still, we sent it off, and Gina assured me it would be fine. After all, there's no way he can misinterpret that. We made sure of it. Bless your optimism, Gina. Bless it. Misplaced as it may have been. So anyway, we were wrong. Richard read it the next morning and lost his mind. He accused me of having character bleed and that I couldn't separate him from the character. I never accused him of anything. I only asked him to stop screaming at me in game as the rogue and tone down the racism in roleplay a little bit. He said if I couldn't get over it, then that wasn't his problem. Continued on to accuse me of being oversensitive and trying to push him out of the game with my accusations, called me transphobic and claimed that that's why I was doing all of this. I still don't know to this day what all of this was. Existing in the game, perhaps? Accused me of sending this on his first week at a new job on purpose to try and get him riled up at work and thus get him fired. I didn't even know he'd started a new job to begin with, nor did I insist that he reply while at work. He chose to do that. He then went on to state that he had been abused and he knows what abuse is, and if you think me yelling at you is abusive, then you have never been abused. Again stating that I was oversensitive and had character bleed. He had been physically and mentally abused. I know this, but this isn't abuse Olympics, and I had never claimed his abuse wasn't valid or that mine is worse than his. I only said my abuse was an explanation in part as to why I couldn't handle his yelling anymore. He then became melodramatic, stating that everyone apparently hates me, and now just leave the game and trying to guilt trip me. 
Oh my god, this is so realistically manipulative. <laughs> my lord. Oh, anyway, while he was going off, I was trying to explain and re-explain myself with Gina's help and figure out where we had made it unclear what I was asking for and where he was getting all of this from. By this point, I was crying and convinced that I was indeed the problem. Naturally, Richard also went to his crush Tessa with all this, and I got a message from Tessa asking what the hell was happening. Thankfully, she didn't accuse me of anything, but wanted to know why Richard is saying he's going to quit the game. I explained the situation, sharing screenshots of the entire conversation with her to save from any he said, she said problems, and told her that I would just leave the game to keep the peace. She was not okay with either of us leaving and took it upon herself to mediate and talk to Richard, myself, and Brian the DM to try and figure out what was was going on. She did at least agree with me that Richard did go too far with his yelling at me all of the time, that the racism isn't cool or edgy as character traits. I mean, when has it ever been? It was just mean. All her assurances that she would figure it out did not help me at all. I spent all day sobbing to my roommate who had D&D &D experience too and had completely agreed with me that this was all insane and that Richard was off his rocker. I was ready to leave and I should have left but I didn't. Tessa convinced both myself and Richard to stay and helped us come up with a time to speak in person to figure everything out. To me, there was nothing to figure out. I had two simple requests that in my mind should not have been that hard to fulfill, but Richard and the others thought otherwise. Alas, in my desperation to stay with this group, I considered my friends and that I had been having fun with, I agreed to have the conversation with Richard. Thankfully, we didn't meet at my apartment. Instead, we met at school. And as we thought that this was a good neutral ground, Gina and Tessa came with me as emotional support. Tessa was insistent that Richard would see the light and understand once he sees how upset you are in person, while Gina was ready to punt a bitch, apparently. <laughs> I remember this all too well, and yet too hazy at the same time. It can play like a horrible, mostly remembered movie in my mind, so excuse me, as this will probably get even wordier than it already was. We got there and went into an empty classroom to have a conversation. Gina went in with me because she didn't trust Richard at all. She was no pushover physically, and she could throw me across the room if she wanted to, so I felt safe with her in there. Richard starts off strong by mocking me for having to bring a friend for support. He used that as proof that I'm over-emotional and an attention whore. I try to ignore this, thinking he's mad at me for misunderstanding, and that he's gonna calm down once I explain to him again. I try and reiterate my points, looking to Gina every now and then to make sure I'm making sense. She's nodding along with the points, and I'm thinking it's going well. Uh, it was not going well. Richard listened and then launched right into the tirade he had done in the messages before, but this time in person and with the most condescending tone one could possibly imagine. He really leaned into the, I know what real abuse is, and if you haven't been physically abused, then you don't know what abuse is concept, explaining how he was beaten as a child and called worthless, Now his parents didn't even see him as a person anymore ever since he came out as trans, since all that happened to me was being yelled at. In his mind, I was pretending and using it as an excuse to be oversensitive and was taking power away from real victims. While I am sorry for what he went through, everything he did, everything he was saying confidently was downright wrong and erasure to those suffering from emotional abuse. I finally, finally got angry at him. Something hard to do, because I hate confrontation. After he finished his condescending tirade, I snapped and yelled at him that I had been hit, if he had to know, not that it mattered in the long run, and that I'm tired of his assumptions about me, and asked him again to explain to me why it was so hard for him to understand that I just wanted him to stop yelling at me. Yelling at me like I was yelling at him right now. I remember yelling something like, it's not nice when someone yells at you, is it? Do you enjoy when I scream like this? Do you think I enjoy it when you do this to me over a game? He could not handle me yelling. Ironic in hindsight. The second I started, he tuned me out and made himself the victim, saying something along the lines of, I was being calm to you, and now you're being unreasonable and a bitch, and I cannot have a conversation with someone like you. And he accused me of being abusive to him and literally stormed out of the classroom. I ended up hugging Gina and sobbing into her shoulder. I ruined her nice dress, which honestly I feel worse about than what I said to him. After Gina confronted me, she had to go to work, and I told her I would be okay. I decided to hang around in the classroom until I could get myself together because I'm not about to walk through school looking like the mess I was at the time. Big mistake. Richard came back through the door within a few minutes of Gina leaving, much to my abject horror, because I didn't want him to see he had made me cry. I wiped away as many tears as possible and tried to calm myself down about three seconds flat, which, yeah, didn't work, before he insisted angrily that we fix this now. 
I'll be honest, I don't remember much of what he said, thank god. I remember more of the same, all the blame put on me, him seeing my tears as proof that I was an attention whore, how I was crying in private, the usual. Eventually, feeling legit scared he would hurt me, I tried to hide behind a movable on wheels whiteboard in one of the corners and started yelling at him to go away, leave me alone, over and over while holding the whiteboard in front of me like a makeshift shield. He would not leave. He started wrestling with me for the whiteboard, eventually ripped it away from me as he was much stronger than I was. At this point, I curled up in the corner in the fetal position, hiding my head in my knees with my arms over it because I was terrified that he was actually going to hurt me. He physically grabbed my arms, pulled them down so he could see my face, forcing me to look at him. He asked me if I was autistic. I'm not, because his boyfriend was, and I was acting like he does when they have an argument. In a vain hope that lying might get him to leave me alone, I just nodded numbly, unable to speak anymore, shaking violently and sobbing uncontrollably. He still held both my arms in a death grip this entire time. I could not move them. This did, thankfully, seem to placate the guy. He went on to lecture me about how, while he understood that it's hard for someone like you, I needed to be better with expressing my emotions and needs and need to learn to not be so sensitive about others, but that since now he knew that I was autistic, he would accept my request because I couldn't help it being autistic and all. I just nodded along. <laughs> this is so fucked. I just nodded along numbly, praying he would leave. When he was finally done, he did mercifully leave, thinking he had done a good thing and won. He had this smile on his face, like he hadn't just traumatized me for life. The second he left the room, I pulled the whiteboard back to hide and started to have one of the worst panic attacks of my entire life. My arms were sore from him holding them, and I was terrified he was going to come back and do something else. It was then that Tessa finally came back into the room, surprised that Richard had been in there still since she thought that he and Gina had left. Apparently, she had gone outside for a bit and didn't notice Richard had come back in. I could barely explain everything that happened to her and ended up just asking her to get me home. I should have left the group then. There was literally no reason why I should have stayed after that horrific experience. However, most of my friends were in the group and I genuinely thought that I was the problem. I was starting to believe everything that Richard had continuously told me and since the only one that was really on my side was my roommate, I thought it was just her and I was being oversensitive. Tessa was only ever on both sides, trying to get us to get along without having to side with one friend or the other. I couldn't even think of playing my character anymore, but I had an easy out since I had been playing my drow with a brother. I killed my drow with the DM's approval, though it was honestly heartbreaking for me, I liked that character, and brought in his brother, also a ranger, who was much more hit things and make them die type. He didn't talk at all. I thought that if I had never ever spoken character, then he could never get mad at me. If I was only a battle character, Unfortunately, as someone who loves roleplay, this ruined the game for me, and from then on, I honestly stopped having fun. Other than enjoying listening to the story that the DM and the other players were creating, I would roleplay when others talked to me, but I never initiated with anybody. Still, somehow became Team Dad because I kept people alive, but it wasn't the same as my first character. I limped through the next year of play, having a panic attack before every game and dreading showing up more and more as the snide comments from the rogue they never stopped. He would mock how edgy my drow was now because he wore a mask to hide his identity. Meanwhile, the rogue slash blood hunter he played literally changed his eye color and name to hide his identity and would lose his mind if I pointed out how his rogue slash blood hunter was very edgy himself. It was exhausting to always be underhandedly insulted, especially when no one ever stood up for me. I started to realize that no one here was really my friend other than Tessa, but she was a pushover and <laughs> Straight up. And that would always give in to Richard because, as I learned that year, they were friends with benefits. The DM would never say anything to Richard because they were best friends forever. Richard was Brian's best man at his wedding, the whole shebang. With my therapist and Gina literally begging me to quit every week, I finally decided to mention the issues I was having one last time to see if they might be addressed since I still didn't want to leave. Now, because I was excited as we were finally getting to my drow's backstory, and I thought it would be epic considering the amazing storyteller Brian was. Can you guess how that went? Did you guess that it was the same as before, but somehow worse? Congrats, you get a cookie, and know that you are smarter than college me. 
This time, I had written the message with my therapist's help and sent my concerns to the dungeon master directly, along with the player. The DM was aware of what happened before. The DM then messaged Richard, and Richard ranted all the same things he said before to the DM. He claimed I had always been after him, I was transphobic towards him, even the DM shut him down on that one, at the very least, that I wanted him out, and I was lying to do it. I was out to ruin friendships. I was oversensitive. I was an attention whore, blah, 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 blah. The whole nine yards. He refused to listen, even when the DM himself spoke to him. Tessa actually got angry at this point and finally agreed with me that Richard was 100% in the wrong and she was so sick of him always claiming that I was the bad guy when I just wanted to stop being bullied slash abused by this man at this point. This time though, the man crossed the ultimate line and came to my apartment unannounced, banging on my door one morning to scream at me about all the usual this time with extra rage because I had lied about him to his friends and that I was going to set the record straight or else. Of course, of course it was one of the days that Gina had to work early. I'm sure he knew this and planned to come when I was alone, so I had no backup or anything. I did not let him in. I told him he would leave or I would call the police. Eventually, when I opened the main door to show him through the still locked storm door that he was pounding on that I had dialed 911 and I was about to press the call button. He finally left screaming profanity the whole way and cussing my name to the heavens. I had another panic attack and locked myself in my bedroom until Gina came home. After hearing it was all the same excuses, having him come to my house to threaten me and the DM just saying, I talked to him and he promised he would be better. I finally quit while having a panic attack about D&D in my therapist's office. I didn't even give it one more game like they wanted me to. Him coming to my house finally broke me out of my stupor. Me thinking it was me and I could deal with it. I was very concerned. He was going to physically hurt me if I didn't do what he wanted. And so was Gina by now. It was years too late, but it was finally over. The messages were sent. All I got back was, that's too bad. Sorry to see you go from the DM. Not one person from the group messaged me to ask why I was leaving. That told me everything I needed to know. I blocked all of them other than Tessa, who ended up cutting Richard out of her life and apologizing profusely to me for not doing more through everything, and I have not seen or heard of them since. I wish nothing but the worst on Richard, and I don't feel bad for saying that. Fuck you, Richard. It was an instant weight off my shoulders, and while I missed the fun parts of D&D and the friends I thought I had, the lack of stress was obvious to me immediately. I finally started to enjoy college life again. I didn't play for over half a decade before I finally got the courage to join a West Marcher server a few years back and found the best two groups of players I have ever had in my life. I'm a DM for one and a player for the other. For a while, Richard managed to kill my love for D&D and I was terrified to play again, but I am happy to come back to this hobby. These are now some of my best friends and I'm so happy D&D brought us together. The one thing I will never forget from this, and I hope everyone takes this from the tried and true saying, no D&D is better than bad D&D. If you haven't learned this yet, please know, nothing is worth shit like this. You will find better people to play with. They exist out there, you just have to search for them. There was so much in that story, and I cannot possibly cover it all in one analysis. Character Bleed is a video in itself that I've wanted to talk about for a long time. In case you don't know, Character Bleed is a big reason why it's what my character would do can become a problem. It's essentially when the effects and the emotions in the game bleed into real life. The classic example of it's what my character would do is somebody is being usually a dick to another person. And yeah, it's what your character would do, but it doesn't matter. Those emotions, those effects, they're bleeding into the real world. We can't separate entirely from our characters. Now, we should separate from our characters. However, it's impossible to forget your entire real life and all the experiences that you have been through. This is not entirely a bad thing, allowing emotions and effects to bleed into the real world to a degree with moderation can be good. Like for example, when I go out to watch a movie like Get Out, a horror movie, that movie is scaring me, the real life me, I am scared. I want to be scared, I'm watching a horror movie, that's why I'm there. And that's good. That's a good form of bleed. Another great example is the end of Critical Role Campaign 1. Not only was the cast crying because the campaign that they were playing is over, and that's sad, but also because there was a lot of <clears throat> stuff that happened. And those emotions not only affected their characters, but affected the players as well. However, when the effects of bleed are negative, they can be really negative. Like for example, in this story, we had somebody yelling at another player, being very, very mean to their character. And while 
yes, that sort of conflict can be good. I mean, think of how many times in Critical Role Campaign 2, Ford was yelling at Caleb. I mean, that happened plenty of times. However, both players consented to that sort of conflict. That was something both players were down to do. In this story, Clearly, there is a non-consenting party, somebody who's going out of her way to inform another player, look, I am not interested in fulfilling this plot line, and the other player is just not hearing it at all. This is a massive red flag. This girl is having some very, very reasonable requests. She's not requesting anything crazy. She's not requesting that this guy get kicked out of the group. She's just requesting that he ease off. She didn't even say stop, just relax a little bit. The conflict can be good. It just doesn't need to be so intense because this is, again, a game and everyone should be having fun. However, it seems like he, I don't know, he gets some kind of kicks out of screaming at other people or something because he just didn't ease off. And that, to say the least, is really bad. Of course, if he talked to the player and she consented to have an incredibly antagonistic, intense relationship, then I think that that would be okay. But he didn't, and that is the main problem. I mean, there's a thousand main problems here. I can't really say that's the main one. There are so many. I understand that the guy has some baggage and some hurt in his past, and I'm not happy that those things happen to him. I'm not, all right? That sucks no matter who is the victim. However, at the end of the day, what he's doing is hurting other people in many different ways. There are so many red flags here, way more serious red flags than the ones that we typically come across in a D&D horror story. This goes way beyond the game and into some really nasty real world stuff. I cut out so many moments of me just reacting to the story because I feel like I was harping on the fact that this is bad, really, really bad. So I'm just gonna say it at the end here. This is bad, really, really bad. But yeah, I, I feel like we need to remember and have a reminder sometimes that at the end of the day, while we're playing these nerdy fantasy games, we are playing with other people minimizing harm and maximizing fun for those people, for the people around us, for ourselves. That's part of the game. These games can form some of the best memories of your life. Don't let them form the worst ones, guys. That was kind of a long analysis. Hope you guys, I don't know, enjoyed it? I'll make a whole video about Bleed one day if enough people request it, I guess. But anyway, look, if you guys enjoyed the video, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then you can check out Shadow Over Karakonos, my actual play D&D podcast that is linked in the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content right as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down into the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment. Don't forget to love each other to let me know you made it to the end of the video. In essence, like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you all next time. Take care of yourselves and farewell.